good morning. i'm robert summercrass. i'm dean of terry at the university of georgia. i want to welcome all of you to this february edition of our terry third thursday speaker series. i also want to welcome you to the teac, the terry executive education center. i've talked with some of you in the room and i know that in some cases this is your first time coming to a terry third thursday this facility here at one live oak is the uh, Terry College's main way of connecting with the Atlanta business community and alumni community. We run a variety of programs, both credit and non-credit here, so it's been uh, a terrific way to stay in touch with Atlanta and have a kind of a home base. Last month at Terry Third Thursday, um, we had James Langford speaking on behalf of the Jekyll Island Development Project. And uh, I am sorry that I missed it. I heard it was very well attended, and I heard that it was also very interesting and, and had some good discussion. Uh, I did have to miss it, though, because I was on the southern uh, part of the Economic Outlook series, uh, giving that uh, speech to the, uh, some of the cities in the south of the state. And uh, some of you have been to that. Um, I've heard that the kickoff in Atlanta for the Economic Outlook is the single largest event outside of Athens that the university has. Now that's obviously excluding athletics, but it's a <laughs> it's a big thing. After Atlanta, we take the economic outlook to nine cities around the state, and the program really serves a dual purpose for us. Obviously, a primary purpose is to provide the forecast and the analysis that is developed by our Seelig Center and its uh, director Jeff Humphreys, and help uh, the business community make some good decisions. But it has a second purpose. And that's for the Terry College and for me uh, to meet some of the business leaders around the state and connect with some of the alumni around the state. And I, I found that that's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, I've been to some of the regional business centers now. I've, I've had a chance to uh, hear the ideas and hear some of the concerns that alumni in different parts of the state have. Before going any further, I want to recognize uh, some of the sponsors of Terry Third Thursdays. Our premier corporate sponsor is Bank of North Georgia. And uh, today they're represented by Julie Drake and Matt Powell. Could I have you stand for just a second? All right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Deborah Boy, sorry. Um, Deloitte uh, is represented today. It's another corporate sponsor by Adam uh, Weinstein and Megan Koulos. And could you stand? And uh, let me recognize our two media sponsors uh, from the Atlanta Business Chronicle. We're joined by Jen Aronson, uh, Shelley Lewis, Cheryl McDonald, Sonia Thomas, uh, Paula Wells. Um, and I hope I got the list correct there. Could you stand? All right. Thank you. And from Public Broadcasting Atlanta, uh, we're joined by Harriet Hoskins Aberhall and Jared Blass. Could they stand, please? All right. Let's uh, give our sponsors, uh, corporate and media, a round of applause. Now let me just uh, mention a couple of our upcoming events at Terry Third Thursdays. In March, we'll have Julio Ramirez here. Julio, as uh, many of you know, is uh, Executive Vice President for Global Operations at Burger King. Uh, he's also um, a 1977 graduate of our MBA program. Then in April, uh, we're looking forward to have Dame, having Damon Evans here. And again, as many of know, you know, he is our Athletic Director. Uh, more importantly, he is also a Terry alum uh, a 1992 finance grad. You can register for those and any of our Terry Third Thursday speaker series events at our website. So uh, please uh, take a look at the college website and uh, there are a number of things that we have going on. I also want to take a moment and thank some of the members of our alumni board. We've got an, uh, an alumni board meeting later today and many of our alumni board members are here with us. Um, they have worked, uh, some of them have worked with our alumni office to line up the Terry Third Thursday speaker series for us. Um, they've helped us in many other ways, so I want to thank you for a job well done. Last thing before introducing the speaker is uh, I'd like to uh, say a minute, uh, take a minute and talk about our alumni awards and gala that's coming up in May. Uh, Terry has been presenting awards to alumni since 1964, so that's nothing new. But last year was the first time that our alumni board took the awards and added in a black tie gala. They did the presentation of awards, and while this was before I started with Terry, I have heard from a lot of people that the night was spectacular. 
So uh, we had Governor Purdue there as a, an honorary auctioneer. Uh, both of our senators, Isaacson and Chambliss, were represented. Uh, the event was such a success that the alumni board concluded that this had to be an annual event, and so it will be. The uh, gala will be held this year on May 3rd over at the Weston Buckhead, uh, so right across Lenox Square from where we're at right now. Uh, I hope you'll join us for what would, uh, I'm sure, be a really fun night and a really good way to recognize some of the, uh, the people that make Terry what it is. Let me uh, introduce our speaker now. Uh, Doug Ben has served as Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Rare Hospitality Incorporated since 1998. Rare Hospitality is a restaurant company with more than 300 locations. Their concepts have included Longhorn Steakhouse and the Capitol Grill. Doug was highly involved with negotiations that led to Rare's acquisition by Darden Restaurants for $1.4 billion. That deal was completed on October 1st, and he's now assisting with the integration of the two companies. As CFO, Doug uh, was responsible for accounting, uh, financial reporting, payroll, cash management, budgeting, internal audit, and IT. Prior to the acquisition by Darden, uh, Rare was a publicly traded company, and Doug's primary responsibility was the investor relations function. Earlier in his career, Doug, Doug was a financial consultant for, to the restaurant industry, uh, and from 1987 to 1997, he was CFO for a company called Innovative Restaurant Con Concepts Incorporated. Uh, that was sold to Applebee's uh, back in 1995, and once again, Doug was deeply involved in the negotiations. And that kind of brings us to the subject for Doug's talk today. Uh, twice in his career, Doug has been uh, through the negotiation, the acquisition, and the integration of two major companies. Uh, he's here to talk about post-merger integration do's and don'ts after the deal is done. Doug, could you please come up here? Good morning. Thank you, Dean Summercrass, for that uh, nice introduction. And thanks to uh, Sarah Cook uh, and to the Terry College for having me here today. It is certainly an honor and a privilege to be standing here before you this morning. When I was preparing to come here today, I took a look at the Terry Third Thursday website and was reviewing the list of prominent past and future speakers and their topics. I asked my daughter, a senior in high school who is strongly considering Georgia for college this fall, whether she would like to come to breakfast and to hear me speak. She took a rather long look at the website and the title of my topic. When the deal is done, post-merger integration do's and don'ts. After a short pause, she said, Dad, can you get me tickets when Damon Evans is speaking in April? <laughs> she followed that by, no offense, Dad. None taken, I guess, but I considered changing the title of my talk to When the Season is Done, with the subtitle Likely Keys to UGA's 2008 Dominance in College Football. But alas, I decided to stick to something that I knew more about, and while there is little chance that I can, can compete with Sonny Seiler's upcoming talk about UGA, hopefully you will find this interesting as well as informative. I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate my wife, Mickey, being here in lieu of my daughter. <laughs> On any given day, you can pick up the Wall Street Journal or the AJC or really any other major news publication, and you can find a story about some new merger that's been announced, or you can read about M&A transactions that are in the works. And that's not even the half of it. I've found that most about 50% of all M&A activity is never publicized. And when I see these articles and merger announcements, a couple of questions pop into my head. How many of these M&A transactions are truly successful? And similarly, 
how many accomplished the objectives and the target and the and the targets that the acquirer had in mind in my industry the restaurant industry the answer is not very many as you've heard I've had some personal experience with M&A activity having been fortunate enough to be in a leadership position in, in negotiating the sale the closing and the transitioning of two businesses lots of energy and effort go on on the part of both the buyer and the seller through the negotiation process getting all the detailed due diligence work done late nights hammering out complex legal documents culminating and finally announcing the deal many times both parties get to the closing table with their tongues hanging out and when the closing documents are signed everyone breathes a sigh of relief but the closing is only the beginning post closing is where the real work begins this is where the war is won and lost and where the objectives and the targets are met or not from a timeline standpoint it's similar to having the football first and 10 at the 20 yard line after receiving the opening kickoff most of the work is in front of you proper handling of post merger of the post merger integration process is to me what dictates the success or failure of most merger transactions now there have been a lot of books written about how to integrate two companies and I'm not going to try to cover this topic broadly but rather I'm going to focus on four after the deal is done things to consider doing or perhaps to strongly consider not doing and I've selected these four in an admittedly biased fashion they're not necessarily the most important considerations but they are ones that are fresh on my mind things that I've seen handled well or handled poorly firsthand the first and perhaps the most important thing to do is what I'll refer to as keep filling the trust cup post merger integration management begins as soon as the deal is announced waiting oftentimes for several months for the deal to close would be a recipe for failure the moment the transaction is revealed uncertainty begins to fill the organization both organizations but particularly the, or the acquired company and almost immediately the trust that had been established by management in their company with their people over perhaps many years begins to erode and to almost evaporate most people will probably be surprised that the merger is taking place they probably feel betrayed they are skeptical and they're awful fearful of what's what's going to be the next shoe to drop after all if management who I trusted kept this a secret what else aren't they telling me about people no longer trust what they're being told their trust cup is empty so it's important to take steps to begin to earn back that lost trust without trust people want to have everything documented even though we told our people at rare early on that their salary their benefits their health plans and in our case they're all important dining benefits would remain unchanged through year-end they took a wait-and-see approach all of a sudden everyone was from the show me state of Missouri one way to begin to earn back employee trust is with frequent and honest communication and it's best if this communication is done in person by people at the top of the organization this isn't a time for top executives to hide in their offices and to send the lieutenants out to talk to the troops this isn't a time for an artfully worded email the message delivered must be consistent and realistic and it must be communicated on more than one occasion each time you tell people that you're going to do something a certain way and then they evidence that happening trust is built for instance we assured people even though the merger was taking place we were still going to allow them to replace employees that left the company so that they could remain fully staffed and get the necessary work done without overburdening 
those that were remaining. When people saw this happening, their trust levels increased. One of the keys, I think, when communicating with employees is to be sure not to overpromise, to be realistic about what people can expect. In Rare's recent acquisition by Darden, we told people that the two organizations had similar cultures and where they were different, we were going to pick the best of both worlds. We should have realized that this was an unrealistic expectation to set. We probably should have better articulated that there would be differences in our cultures, what they would be, so that people better knew what to expect. This kind of realistic and honest communication would have better built their trust. We held numerous town hall meetings with the entire support center, which is what we call our corporate office, early on. These gatherings were led by the top executives of the company and were set, to, set up to be non-threatening and interactive. In these meetings, we not only communicated information, we also allowed people to vent their disappointment, frustration, and yes, quite possibly their anger. Additionally, we allowed them to ask all of their questions. One thing I think we did a particularly good job with was not pretending that we knew all the answers. If we didn't know the answer, we told them that we didn't. We told them we'd get back to them at some time in the future. We told them how we thought the merger process was going to work, its timing, but that it would not be perfect. We also set the expectation that ambiguity, uncertainty, and unanswered questions would be the order of the day for the foreseeable future. I think people appreciated the open format of these town hall meetings, and this helped to increase their trust. Take every opportunity to keep filling the trust cup, because it empties quickly when the transaction is announced, and it fills back up slowly, drop by drop. The second post-merger integration rule that I'll offer for your consideration is don't underestimate the positive impact of having emotional intelligence. You've all heard the term emotional intelligence before, but what do I mean by emotional intelligence in this instance? People or companies with emotional intelligence incorporate awareness and sensitivity about the real psychological and emotional impact the merger is having on people's lives, and they integrate that thought process into their post-merger integration plan. Having emotional intelligence doesn't mean being soft. It doesn't mean not getting the financial benefits of the transaction. But it does mean understanding and being sincerely conscious of people's thoughts and feelings. It may be as simple as explaining why something is being done rather than simply issuing a directive. One of Darden's objectives was to entice as many of Rare's management people as possible to move to Orlando and to join the Darden combined company team. They had a keen interest in keeping as many and as much of Rare's human resources as they could. Darden is an extremely successful company and very well run and the integration process has, in general, gone very smoothly. But when it came to courting Rare's people, the process had a slight flaw. In my opinion, the process was too mechanical, a little too bureaucratic, too impersonal. It lacked sufficient emotional intelligence. It wasn't that the financial offers weren't good or, the, or that the positions offered to Rare's people weren't good or that the, the, the relocation benefits weren't generous. In the end, fewer acceptances were received from Rare Hospitality's people than had been hoped because, at least from my perspective, sufficient time wasn't spent to connect in more than a numerical way with the people being offered positions. Perhaps the importance of emotional intelligence can best be illustrated by a statement made to me by one of Rare's management team 
that decided to decline an offer for continued employment. The offer was good, and the position was good, but I didn't get the distinct impression that they really wanted me. A little more emotional intelligence would have probably mitigated this person's concern. I think we also potentially missed an opportunity to benefit from demonstrating our emotional intelligence in some of the corporate communication. RARE was acquired by Darden and our support center in Atlanta was to be closed down and during the ensuing nine months, all operations moved to Orlando. Some people that work for RARE in Atlanta would be moving to Orlando, but many would be required to find other jobs once their particular department was transitioned to Florida. Understandably, the people that already worked for Darden were very excited that, they, that their company had acquired a couple of great new growth brands creating new or different opportunities and promotional prospects for them. Much of the, the communication that came out touted the excitement of bringing two successful companies together, the positive impact the merger would have on employee opportunity, or the value the transaction would create for shareholders. However, as you might imagine, this communication most probably missed the boat for the rare group in Atlanta. It didn't sufficiently take into account what was happening to them and how they were feeling about it. To them, indicating a it indicated a lack of understanding. It perhaps was not sufficiently emotionally intelligent. In a survey taken shortly after the merger was completed, a quote from an anonymous rare employee went like this. It's already happened and I can't undo it. However, I wish that management would stop trying to make me excited about it. Our communication could have shown more appreciation for the fact that the first two letters in the word merger are me and that people are really concerned about themselves and their futures first, no matter how fantastic or exciting the merger is supposed to be. Having and utilizing emotional intelligence is smart business. It's motivating and its use helps the merging organizations accomplish their desired results. Don't underestimate the positive impact of having emotional intelligence or for that matter, the negative impact from its shortage. Another post-merger integration don't that I'm cognizant of is don't assume that all of the financial synergies should come from the target. In most M&A transactions, particularly involving public companies, communication with shareholders includes an estimation of the financial synergies or savings that are likely to result from the efficiencies created by the merger of the two firms. And in most acquisitions of any size, a consultant like Accenture or Boston Consulting is brought in to help the combined companies to, among other things, identify those synergies and make them a reality. The assumption that's generally present, perhaps it's only implied, is that the acquiring company's people and processes will continue and that all of the synergies will come from a cutback in the number of targets people or the modification of the targets processes. While this is perhaps a normal assumption, following it exclusively can result in a combined organization that has weaker infrastructure and potentially less talent. In both merger transactions in which I was involved, the consultant did a good job of organizing the acquiring company's thought processes. They worked closely with the acquirer and management of the target to help determine the number of people that would be needed in each department to make the new combined organization operate effectively. Together, they produced many spreadsheets, templates, timelines, and assisted, that assisted their analysis and helped them decide the number of FTE, full-time equivalent employees, that would now be needed in purchasing, construction, IT, accounting, payroll, and really all other functional areas of the business. 
Many of you who have lived in Atlanta for a while will remember the Rio Bravo Cantina brand. When Innovative Restaurant Concepts, the parent company owner of Rio Bravo, was sold to Applebee's, our analysis concluded that a specific number of people would be needed in the, in the combined IT organization to ensure that the necessary continuing work would get done and that service levels to the restaurants would be maintained. Before any reduction in personnel, the combined companies had more FTEs than our analysis indicated would be needed, so excess people would have to be eliminated. Despite the fact that the Target's IT organization was very efficiently run and had very high customer satisfaction scores, all of the desired headcount reduction came from the group of Target people, and consequently, none came from the acquirer group. It's easy to assume the Target's people are not as well qualified because the Target company is usually smaller. And as I said earlier, it's a normal assumption that personnel savings would come from the Target's people. However, most of the time, at least in acquisitions of successful companies, there are a number of reasons why the Target is doing well. Many of those reasons have to do with the talent, the experience, and the energy level of their people. And every good management person knows that somewhere in their organization they have some so-called dead wood. So perhaps, maybe, just maybe, there are people in a Target's organization that are better, perhaps significantly better, than people already in place at the acquirer. It's certainly a more thorny road to follow, but consideration of the capabilities of the Target's people in comparison to the people currently employed could pay big dividends. Similar dividends are possible when evaluating the processes to be used in the combined organization. The Target company may have the best approach. In my view, Darden has done a good job of studying the processes used at Rare and in adopting ones that represent an improvement in the processes that were currently in place. Don't assume all the financial synergies should come from the target. Taking a close look at the talent pool of the target and the processes they have in place could potentially enhance the strength of the combined company. The fourth and my final post-merger integration consideration. Assume that speed is better than perfection. As I indicated earlier, the minute the merger is announced, things immediately change in an organization. A new set of organizational dynamics begins. Many emotions permeate the company from shock to anger to fear to grieving to frustration. Productivity falls, rumors abound, the organization's paralyzed, and around the coffee machine, everyone is telling ain't it awful stories. The biggest risk to stabilization and the continued operational success of the acquired company is the vast amount of ambiguity and uncertainty that inevitably exists. Now is the time for speed to take over to eliminate this ambiguity and uncertainty as quickly as possible. It's not a time to be perfect. Actions that are slow, measured, cautious, and deliberative are not necessarily your friend. It's often said that knowing that the news is bad is better than not knowing. When people don't know what their future holds, they instinctively spend the majority of their time trying to find out, or at a minimum, worrying about it. They're in survival mode. Your employees want you to move fast. They don't want the merger to drag on. The natural inclination of prudent managers is to use a measured approach to problem solving. After all, the golden rule of any worthwhile carpenter or business executive is what? Measure twice, cut once. Executives want to get it right the first time. They want to avoid making mistakes so potentially they move slowly. They may tend to delay decisions until they're sure they're right. 
This natural inclination or normal approach is generally not a good approach to use when integrating two companies. Making early decisions and communicating them helps to eliminate that uncertainty disease that's part of any merger environment. When we did one of our employee surveys shortly after the Darden transaction was announced, we found that one of the biggest concerns from our people was the speed of the integration. People were concerned that some would leave Rare before the transaction and integration were complete, leaving others holding the bag. A number of others commented, why are they taking so long? We can't stand not knowing. When organizations move quickly, managers know that they're going to make some mistakes. Mistakes are unavoidable. However, most mistakes that are made are correctable. And in the end, the benefit of a quick decision in a post-merger integration environment and the uncertainty that it removes far outweighs the negative from the mistake. One mistake we made, realized and quickly corrected, was not letting everyone know soon enough what their, max, what their minimum time with the post-merger company would be. Many people were fearful that they would lose their job even though it was communicated to them that the vast majority of them would be offered employment with the combined company, which is in fact what happened. However, they wanted to know the worst case timing for the potentiality that they might be unemployed. People knew the merger with Darden was going to close on October 1st, but they didn't know for sure whether they'd be unemployed on October 2nd. The moment we communicated that no one would lose their job before December 31st, and that within 45 days, everyone that was losing their position would know their ultimate end date, most of the fear subsided of the uncertainty had been largely removed. Faster communication of this information would have been a more effective course of action. Assume that speed is better than perfection. You don't have the time to take your time, and perfect is not a reasonable expectation anyway. Well, I certainly, again, appreciate you being here today. If anyone in the crowd would like to have copies of my comments, and you can get me your email address, I'd be happy to send them to you. And I think now maybe we have a few minutes for questions or comments that anyone in the audience has. Let me tell you, a couple of years ago, I came to Athens to speak to a Terry College graduate school class. And since I like interactive audiences, I promised them, the students, free Longhorn food <laughs> to ensure that they would be engaged and to ask me questions. So for each question that they asked, I gave each student $10 gift certificate to Longhorn. So needless to say, when you offer college students food, they take advantage of it and the questions never stopped. Now for this group, I figured $10 wasn't going to do it. So, for the first three questions or comments I get, I'll send you a $50 dine out to the Capitol Grill, which is right over there in Buckhead, if you give me your name. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Am I going to move to Orlando? I'm not moving to Orlando. I am, um, a lot of things factored in that decision. Uh, one being uh, our ties here in Atlanta. And it, so many things, I talked about uh, what uh, caused people to accept or not possess, accept positions that they got with this uh, combined company. And, and a big part of it is your, your spouse works or you have some other big tie to Atlanta or some reason you, you don't want to move to Orlando. But I, I'm, I'm not interested in doing that at this point in time. Uh, I don't know what 
is next on the docket for me, but I know that uh, from now until June 30th, I've got a lot to do to just make sure all this is smoothly transitioned to Florida, but uh, I don't have any intention of, of, of going there. Yes, sir. Next question. If we could, if you could wait until you get a microphone to ask your question, because we're webcasting this, please. I could repeat them, too. That's great. Um, yes, yeah, over here. The employee relations are, are real important, but how do you handle the rumor mills and whatnot that are going on in the pre-contract while you're negotiating before the deal's really ready to be announced and everybody's working under confidentiality? How do you handle that sort of situation? That, that is, a, it, it was amazing to me. We were very, very careful about that because as you might uh, imagine, being a public company, if the word would have got, gotten out that the, the, the deal was done at 38.15 per share and our stock was trading at about 27 when the discussions were going on. So it was a significant premium to what the stock was trading for. And so we just, uh, we, we had closed door meetings. Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing was, was keeping it from uh, our assistants, actually, the people that were working on it. There's only three, we had a very narrow scope. We had only our attorneys, and for a very long period of time, only three people within our company knew what was going on. Uh, three people on the board. And uh, we, we expanded that group slowly where it included about five or six people. But there was a lot of work being done by, I'll call executive people that normally don't work. They kind of just stand around and don't, don't do much. But so we'd see there was actually work that had to be done in order to, and we did a good job of that. I was amazed by the fact that nothing got out because the, the, the stock did not trade up at all. There was a day or two when I had a little bit of a concern where it went up, but it went right back down. So it must not have been too much of a rumor. Ah, I got to go to this side of the room. How about, yes, sir. There are a lot of um, ugly financial and accounting reporting rules that are coming into effect next year. And I know in this transaction, that size, there would have been a lot of transaction and restructuring, the re transaction and restructuring costs that you incurred uh, that uh, got parked in the purchase price uh, when it was done are going to hit the, uh, the P&L. I'm curious, do you think that that deal would have been done uh, under the new rules? And how do you think the new... Um, the, the effect of these rules are going to, do you think it'll change the, the acquisition environment out there? Uh, that's a great question. And, I, and I, 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 I don't really think that they'll have a material impact. And here's why. Normally, when companies, it, it, a public company acquiring another company uh, is concerned about, obviously, what their shareholders are going to think about this transaction. And I know that we, uh, I, I listen to Bloomberg Radio a lot now, and, and they always are announcing these companies' earnings in the 10-second in the, uh, snippets. And they always say, uh, what do they say, without charges or without something. They're, they're trying to give normalized earnings. Well, that's the way we always talked about our earnings. And that's the way that a company like an acquirer is going to talk about their earnings. They're going to say, our operating, our they're going to announce their gap results because they have to, and then they're going to say our operating results were this, and we had one-time charges related to the acquisition of, of this amount, and then th there's obviously going to be continuing expenses, but uh, ongoing expenses with a, a lot of time was spent in this acquisition with uh, purchase price accounting adjustments. They had I, I untold number of people that I've had to talk to about, uh, uh, I think we used every one of the big four at some point in time, from tax people or whatever, but I don't think it's going to have a, a huge impact. I think that the firms ex try to explain the accounting away and try to get their investors to focus on the operational results. Yes, sir. Uh, of the four points that you mentioned, would you weigh them differently when acquiring a successful company versus acquiring a more troubled company? Uh, I don't know that I'd weigh them differently. I, I, I think that uh, the biggest thing that really uh, weighs heavily in my mind right now is 
like the shock factor that, that in dealing with, with that because we did a good job of keeping this quiet and everyone was pretty darn surprised about it. Some people said, well, I thought this was going to happen, but I don't know that they really did. But I, I, I think that the same things uh, go on uh, uh, throughout. Maybe in an unsuccessful company, there's uh, maybe there's less likelihood, uh, maybe more likelihood, excuse me, more likelihood that somebody would think that, that, that there'd be some kind of uh, a merger or acquisition coming in the future, but um, I don't think anyone in our company thought that this was anywhere within the scope of what would even be considered. So um, maybe that's the difference. Maybe I would say, but, but, I, but, I, but I think the real key is, and it takes some courage, but being brave enough to talk uh, about this often with people and uh, to let them go. It's, it's, it, you know, I, I explain it like it's a little bit like a death to a lot of these people because they've worked for the company for five or 10 or 15 or 20 years and now you're telling me that, that you've done this, you've betrayed me is basically what they, they're saying. So you have, to, uh, you have to be willing to listen to that and you have to be willing to meet face to face with a lot of people. So we had a lot of these town hall meetings that I think really helped. And some of them were rather heated. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mazi Gadusi with Stateside Capital. Uh, you had me with a at the ten dollar gift certificate, but uh, <laughs> uh, my question is: uh, emotional intelligence is such an abstract concept. I can understand it at a personal level, but how would you define it at an organizational level? Well, it, it's it, it's it, let, let me let me put it this way, and I I I I, I want to start off by saying that that that. Darden is a very well-run company. They're a $7 billion company. We're a $1 billion company. So I got to admit, I don't know anything about what it's like to run a $7 billion company. But I do know that what we had in our company, I'll call it more touchy-feely. I don't know from an organizational standpoint, but I do know that um, when talking to people uh, about employment opportunities, uh, Something other than putting a sheet of paper in front of them and saying, I mean, these are the facts. This is, this is salary, bonus, benefits, uh, moving expense allowance, all this, and it all adds up to pretty good, but there's some kind of uh, connection that needs to be made. And I don't know how you do that necessarily from an organizational perspective. It was part of our culture. And I don't know if it can be part of a company's culture that's seven times bigger than this. I don't know if it can be. Uh, I, I'm just, maybe it can be, but I know that what we worked toward, when I started uh, with Rare, we had, our annual revenues were about $200 million, and, and uh, 10 years later, they were about a billion dollars, and what we worked hard on was what we called growing the company smaller. It was, uh, it, it, we had lots of uh, quarterly gatherings with people. We tried to uh, make it as personal as we could. How long could we have con continued that as we went from a billion dollars to two billion dollars? I don't know. Uh, it, it's awful hard to say. But I do know that, uh, that if it's, we, we had core values and part of those core values were honoring people was, 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 a, was a big part of it. And it just was just part of our culture and it's, I don't know if it can be part of a bigger company's culture or not, but I think it's important. Yes, sir. On filling the trust cup, you talked about um, com frequent communication from the top. For both, speak maybe for both the target company and the acquirer, when you say the top, from which entity does the top need to be communicating? One thing, I, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that uh, the target people want to be talked to by their people that they have been associated with the whole time. Now, I will say that when, uh, when we announce this transaction, we, uh, everybody always knows something is up when we say, we're, we're, we're having a, a meeting of the whole support center in the training room in 15 minutes. <laughs> but showing up at that meeting, Clarence Otis, who's the CEO of Darden, came to the meeting and 
I think that the fact that even though he was with Darden and we were uh, rare hospitality, that that had a big impact because it took, I, you know, again, I use the word courage, it took some courage again to do that because it, it could have been a situation where people wanted to, um, you know, throw rocks or something at him. But, but I thought that that went over well. But in general, I think it's, it's just that, that they, want, they don't want to hear uh, so much from the acquirer people if they're not going to continue on with the acquiring company. They want, to, they want to hear from the people that they've been managed by and reporting to and working with uh, over time. So I think it's, it's uh, the trust cup is, it, it, it's, it's hard to get it back because you, truly that was the most shocking thing to me was that uh, the trust and all and everything that had been established uh, all of a sudden was gone in five minutes. Okay, now we don't trust you anymore. You've done 50 things that we trusted and showed we trusted you and now you've announced this and we don't anymore. And I can see why. Uh, but uh, but I think that, it, that it, it's important for the for the for the acquiring company to really get with their people. There was a question here somewhere. Yes, sir. Uh, do you uh, get involved in other things? Uh, what I'm thinking about as I listen to you, I've had an investment in a, in a condominium complex for 27 years, and I'm 87 years old, and I'm ready to get out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and on two occasions, uh, purchasers have uh, made offers, and uh, all but one or two of the owners of condos uh, have opposed it. I don't know whether you have any experience or, or anything you've learned that would help us in uh, getting the buyer and the buyer and the seller together. Yeah, I I don't have any personal uh, I don't have any personal uh, experience with condos. I've worked 25 years in the restaurant business, but uh, I'm sure a lot of the same uh, rules apply. I mean, it, it's uh, you've got to have willingness, right? You have to have one of the things in our transaction that enabled us to keep it quiet was that this was there was no acrimony here. This was a uh, a transaction that both companies wanted to do, and we knew it was imperative both companies keep it quiet. But I think that if you've got people that want to do a transaction, oftentimes there's something down there underneath that that there, this, the people don't want to do it. The the key is to find out well why. What is their what is their hang up? And a lot of it's just a communication, I would think. But I don't know. Well, over the years, we had uh, uh, elsewhere in Mexico City, we had sold some condominium complexes to Kansas City. And one of the owners of the company uh, bought the uh, previous bought one of the condos to add an addition, to add income to help it fund its cost of protection for itself and to sell to Kansas City. <laughs> Sounds like a challenge. <laughs> yes, sir. Could you provide a few more comments on the uh, Rio Bravo acquisition? I'm just curious what ultimately led to the to the disappearance of a pretty well-known brand. Yeah, yeah, and uh, in 1995, uh, basically at the point in time of which there were, uh, I think, 22 or 23 Rio Bravo restaurants. Applebee's International, who very successful company in and of their own right, uh, was looking for a second brand. They had this Applebee's brand that uh, I don't know how many in this room are really Applebee's customers. Probably, I would imagine, not that many. But they have a lot of customers, and they're a very successful brand in 1,900 restaurants. And I think at that time, they had 1,200. But their success came from their a franchising organization. Uh, Rio Bravo was an operational organization. So uh, the way that Applebee's worked was franchising and marketing. The way that Rio Bravo worked was great food all the time, not much marketing, and you know no franchising. So it was a great brand. It had uh, it had uh, great volumes, but Applebee's wanted to make Rio Bravo as, quote, successful as Applebee's and, and grow it that fast. So they had this network of 
60 franchisees that uh, many of them owned a number of Applebee's, 10 or 20 or more. Apple South owned a lot. Uh, and they used these franchisees to build Rio Bravos fast. And in order for a franchise really to work, the concept is the simpler the better. And Applebee's were simple to operate. Rio Bravos weren't particularly simple to operate. So they had to make some modifications to make them simpler to operate. And those modifications really over time eroded what people liked about it. Uh, and, you know, it, I, it, I know that we used to, you know, we diced up all the tomatoes and onions and everything in the back of the house every day, fresh to order everything. And some of that had to change. And it eventually, the fast growth of the brand and spreading it over being managed by 15 or 20 different franchisees as opposed to one company that was really strict about the standards was what kind of caused it to go downhill. Yes, sir. This is a, you didn't hit on this topic necessarily, but I'm curious as a person that's just been through a, a merger, what is your perspective about where the market is at this point in time, and it's been very well publicized about kind of the capital crunch we're currently in and what that means for M&A activity here this year. But I'm just curious your perspective. I think that um, that that it will impact it. It will, will not be a positive for M&A transactions primarily because a year ago or a year and a half ago, these transactions were extremely easy to finance. Uh, in, in fact, private equity uh, would be able to, um, we sold uh, one of our other concepts called Bugaboo Creek Steakhouse. I don't know if there any of you have ever been to that, but we sold that to private equity. And, and uh, the deal was something like one part equity and seven parts debt. I mean, it, they borrowed almost all the money, and I don't think that's available now. So I think that in and of itself is what is going to slow down uh, M&A activity. Uh, I don't think it would change a transaction necessarily like Darden did. They weren't going to be heavily leveraged anyway. They borrowed the money to do our transaction, but they could have borrowed three times that much from almost anybody and not had a problem with getting it financed. But I think the tightness of the credit market uh, it, it, it is going to have a, a negative impact until that uh, kind of I, – people just <laughs> – the rate – it's one of those things, the money's behind this glass, you know, the rates are really low, but no one will loan it to you. <laughs> yes, sir. Having gone through a recent acquisition myself, and I was on the target side, um, you know, you talk about the town hall meetings and the emotional intelligence. How do you, I was a partner in a firm that I was at and still continue to be a partner with the new firm. How do you deal with the culture, even though it's a great culture, it's a great firm, but how do you deal with the things that you had at your company that you can't change in the short run? How do you soothe or try to help the employees feel better about the situation? And, and there's two types of employees, really. There's ones that will be continuing, and then there's ones that you would, that you're incentivizing to stay on to complete some task before they leave and go do the next thing that they're going to do. And, you know, those, you handle those two groups differently. Uh, the ones that are going to continue, like, like you did, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest integration things that's being discussed now is what, they, what Darden calls total rewards. In other words, our management and our support center had uh, a, an, an award package that uh, was this, and theirs had an award package that was equal to uh, or greater than, but it was different. So merging those two together is a big source of uh, discussion and, and, and how we're going to deal with that. But uh, I think that uh, uh, with respect to the cultures, I think that just being upfront and honest about what the cultures are going to be like, tell people they're going to be different. I mean, it, it, you know, we tried to explain early on because it sort of seemed like the old Darden culture, it's pretty much the same as ours, looked like we talked to a few people and all that, but it, it, there's, there's big differences and people are going to have, it, it's, it's like going to work for another company in, in, in a lot of ways. It's not like your job. 
even though they're doing the same job, like all of the Longhorn people, all the Capitol Grill people uh, that were running restaurants uh, or that supervised people that were running restaurants, retained their job and they basically were doing the exact same thing they were doing before. But their, their culture and their uh, experiences and their communication was different. So I think setting the expectation, I mean, there's, so I, my kids say I repeat the same themes over and over again. But, but one of them is setting expectations with people that can be achieved and, and to not set the expectation that everything's going to be perfect, to set the expectation that things are going to be different. Some things you're going to think are better and some things you're not going to think are as good. So I, that's, that's how I'd best answer that, I think. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, people acquisition question, I guess. So what are your thoughts on how do you make the selection process as well as the timing of that process, you know, as you merge these companies from the VP level down to the first level manager? So, um, let me clarify what you're saying. How do you uh, say that again? I, I don't know if I got it. You talked about selecting the best from both companies. Yeah, so okay. So how do you make that selection? You know, because each manager is going to say my people are the best. Well, so. uh, the first step is to recognize that the possibility exists that, <laughs> that, that maybe there's people in the, the target organization that are, are better. And the other is, and I don't know if this is, is really realistic to expect somebody to do, but you look through your organization and you know that there's people, you know, Johnny over there, he's only been doing about 70% of what we thought he should be doing all along, and it looks like there's somebody over here at this company we're acquiring that can do 110% of it. And, and so part of it is the willingness to look, and, uh, I, you know, I, 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 especially that Rio Bravo acquisition, there was just not even a willingness to look. It was, it was more of a, well, okay, so there, these people need to go away, and they're all your people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Doug, on behalf of the Terry College, its faculty, staff, and alumni, I want to thank you for that presentation, and I'd like to present you with this uh, sculpture by local artist Paul Benzunas. Okay. So as a memento for today. Uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, I hope I see you again next month. As you're leaving, remember, just uh, tell the parking lot attendant you were a Terry Third Thursday attendee, and that's your ticket out of here. So sure. thanks, and I hope I see you again next month. Thanks. Good. Yeah, you're welcome.